You'd think it was easy to make carbon. It's the basis of all known life and it's the universe's fourth most abundant element. However, it can only be made because the behaviour of matter seems to be rather finely tuned to permit its existence. Make of that what you will, plenty of people have. In the early part of the 1900s, people thought stars shone by shrinking and converting gravitational potential energy to heat. In fact, this is the way they heat up in the first place, but it's not the main source of their energy. In 1920, Arthur Eddington likened the contraction theory to an unburied corpse. He noted that the Sun, by fusing hydrogen to helium, would convert mass to energy. It would therefore have sufficient fuel to shine for billions of years. In 1939, Hans Bethe filled in the details of the proton-proton chain reaction explaining how the Sun gets energy by fusing hydrogen into helium. He also unveiled the CNO cycle, which explained how massive stars convert hydrogen to helium. Although Bethe's CNO cycle relied on the existence of carbon, he had a problem. He couldn't find any reasonable way that elements heavier than helium could be made. Beta investigated the possibility of making carbon by bringing together three helium nuclei, alpha particles. He found that the process would need temperatures of more than a billion Kelvin. This is pretty high, our sun's core is about 16 million Kelvin. He assumed the coming together of three alpha particles was a non-resonance process. What do we mean by a resonance or non-resonance process? These concepts are crucial to carbon's existence. Think about the traditional Bohr model of a hydrogen atom with an electron behaving like a little planet orbiting a nucleus. The available orbits represent the energies an electron is allowed by the rules of quantum mechanics. We can draw these energy levels like this. In this hydrogen atom, the electron is in its lowest possible orbit, the lowest energy state, the ground state. If the electron picks up the right amount of energy from somewhere, it can move to a higher orbit, one of the possible excited states. In this story, we're not dealing with electrons, we're dealing with nuclei and their energy levels. Just like electrons, nuclei are governed by the laws of quantum mechanics and have permitted energy levels. These are shown here for carbon-12. Nuclei have ground states and excited states. The energies involved are much higher than electron energies because nuclear masses are so much greater. We're dealing with a scale of millions of electron volts. These are nuclear mass energies. They are fixed and independent of the speed of a nucleus. They don't vary with temperature. The kinetic energy varies with temperature and isn't included in these numbers. Now, back to our tale of how to fuse lighter nuclei to make carbon-12. Nuclei are all positively charged and repel one another electrostatically. For nuclear fusion to happen, we need to overcome the Coulomb barrier erected by this mutual repulsion. The trouble early researchers had was that, even in the Sun's core, the temperature wasn't high enough to give nuclei enough kinetic energy to overcome electric repulsion and fuse. George Gamow showed the way in 1928, explaining alpha particle decay with nuclear quantum tunneling. The following year, Robert Atkinson and Fritz Houtermans showed that quantum tunneling allowed nuclear fusion to happen. Quantum mechanics treats atomic scale particles as probabilistic smudges. These can occupy space that they couldn't if they were sharply defined classical particles. Nuclear fusion happens because nuclei tunnel close enough together to merge. Quantum tunneling is optimal when products and reactants have similar energy levels. In other words, when they're in resonance. The reaction's probability increases greatly when there's resonance. The energy level of the products needs to be a little higher than of the reactants because the kinetic energy needs to go somewhere. Now, back to Hans Bethe's problem. The universe shouldn't have much carbon because its non-resonance formation from three alpha particles needs a temperature of a billion Kelvin. Edsel Peter thought about changing the picture. Rather than three alpha particles colliding, he pictured two colliding to make beryllium-8. Beryllium-8 then collides with a further helium nucleus to make carbon. In 1952, he observed that the mass energy level of ground state beryllium-8 was only slightly higher than the energy of a pair of alpha particles. He reasoned that this would lead to an important resonance. Beryllium-8 is highly unstable and it decays back to two alpha particles with a half-life of about 10 to the negative 16 seconds. The resonance is enough to make an equilibrium concentration of beryllium-8. 
Sol Peter argued that this permanent presence of beryllium-8 nuclei allowed them to fuse with further alpha particles to make carbon. In 1939, Beta had reasoned that carbon production needed a temperature of a billion Kelvin. Sol Peter's work reduced the temperature needed for carbon by a factor of 5 to 200 million Kelvin, a temperature achievable in the contracting core of a red giant. In the early 1950s, Fred Hoyle probably knew more than anybody in the world about element formation in stars. He liked Sol Peter's idea that triple alpha production of carbon could be helped by an alpha particle beryllium-8 resonance. He didn't like the idea of 200 million Kelvin. Carbon had to be made in greater quantities than Salpeter's work allowed, and at about 100 million Kelvin. Hoyle compared the mass energy levels of a beryllium plus a helium nucleus and a carbon-12 nucleus. He calculated that if carbon had an available energy level at about 7.7 .7 million electron volts above its ground state, then there would be a resonance with beryllium and helium carbon production would get a huge boost. The boost was necessary because without it there would be no carbon to make physicists to study the problem. Early in 1953, Hoyle asked Willie Fowler and his team of nuclear physicists at Caltech to look for it. This might have appeared crazy, an astronomer telling nuclear physicists that they'd missed one of carbon's energy levels. Nevertheless, Fowler's team looked for the energy level and found it. It's this energy level that allows carbon to exist, and you and me with it. The Hoyle excited state of carbon is more like a loose bunch of three alpha particles than a fully merged ground state carbon nucleus. The great majority of excited Hoyle state carbons fall apart again into beryllium and helium. About 1 in 2400 Hoyle state carbons fully merge into carbon-12, emitting huge amounts of energy. Even today, the behaviour of the Hoyle state continues to intrigue researchers. Hoyle made another prediction. If an alpha particle adds to carbon, you get oxygen. If this fusion reaction was resonant, nearly all the carbon ever made would have ended up as oxygen. Hoyle said therefore that oxygen has no energy levels available for a resonance with carbon and helium. He's been proven correct in this too. Some scientists, including Hoyle, later argued that the triple alpha process has a deeper interpretation. The universe looks to be improbably fine-tuned. The narrow resonance bands without which there would be no beryllium-8 and carbon were evidence of this. They are so delicately arranged that there's little room for variation. Do the delicate patterns imply that the universe had an architect? I'll leave that question to you.